Yesterday on Through the Bible, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, took us through one of the most difficult passages of Scripture to interpret. Today, he resumes this conversation and takes us further into Hebrews chapter 6 with a fascinating discussion about the importance of good works in the life of every Christian. So as you'll hear, it's important to come to these studies in the spirit of prayer. So let's bow our heads and give this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the teaching of your word that helps us understand you better. As we open our Bibles and study your word today, help us put aside anything that distracts us from hearing directly from you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Friends, we are coming to this passage again today in the spirit of prayer, praying that God will help us to understand this passage of Scripture. Now, I'd like to just say again that we are considering this passage, and we're not talking about people losing their salvation, for salvation is not even the subject here. It's if they fall away to renew them to repentance, not salvation. And verse 9 says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Now he's talking about those things which accompany salvation. There is a place for good works, because he's going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's speaking here of the fruit of the Christian's life, because he speaks of that. In verse 7, "...the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it's dressed, receive blessing of God." But if it just brings forth thorns and briars, it's rejected. Now, we'll note several passages here. When Paul wrote to Titus, young preacher, he said to him in Titus 3, 5, it's not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now from this, one might be inclined to think that Paul is not going to have much regard for good works. But you move on down now to verse 8 of this same chapter and listen to him that they who have believed God may be careful to maintain good works. Now, good works do not enter into the matter of salvation, but when one becomes a child of God through faith in Christ, works assume supreme importance. They're very important. It's important, if you're a Christian, that you live the Christian life. It's essential that you do that. When I was in the university as a student, I was sort of an assistant to the teacher in psychology. I thought at one time I'd major in that field. And there was a problem at that time that psychologists discussed. They've moved away from it since then. But which is more important, heredity or environment? Well, my psychology professor, he had a stimulating answer. He said that before you're born, heredity is more important. But after you're born, environment is the major consideration. Now, let's look at that. Before you become a child of God, before you are born again, works do not enter in. You cannot bring them to God because he won't accept them. He says, the righteousness of man's filthy rags in his sight. Now, you don't think God's going to take in a bunch of dirty laundry, do you? He's accepting sinners. But he accepts on the basis of the redemption we have in Christ. And if we have accepted him, we become a child of God. We're born now. Peter put it like this. But ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that ye may show forth the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's First Peter 2, 9. Now, if you've been saved, you're to show forth by your good works before the world that you're redeemed to God. Now, the Christian has something to show forth, and that's the thing 
that he's going to be judged or not. Now, if he's going to continue as a little baby and nothing in the world but a troublemaker and turn people from Christ instead of to Christ, may I say to you, then you can be sure of one thing, that there'll be no reward. In fact, you can be ashamed at his appearing. He says that. Now, will you notice, for as touching those, now will you listen to him, who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then fell away. It's impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, in reading these verses that I've just read, we are brought now to the very center of the study. And I want you to notice, for it is impossible if they shall fall away. Now, the word fall away is an interesting word. In the Greek, it's parapipto, and it's used in other places in Scripture. It never means apostatize. It simply means to fall down, to stumble. It would be absolutely impossible to give it the meaning of apostasy, and you will find that the word parapipto was used in speaking of our Lord when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. Now, the word, it's the same word, parapipto, means just that he fell down. The word means to stumble or fall. Peter fell, but he was not lost. The Lord Jesus said, I prayed that your faith might not fail. He suffered loss, but he was not lost. Then there's the example, I think, of John Mark. He failed so miserably on the first missionary journey that when his uncle Barnabas suggested that he go on the second journey, well, Paul the apostle turned him down, and he says, never, this lad's fail, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm through with him. Well, thank God that God wasn't through with him. He stumbled and fell, but God wasn't through with him, and Paul the apostle had to change his mind because before he died, he wrote, he says, bring John Mark with you, for he is profitable to me for the gospel. Now, may I say to you, neither man lost his salvation, but he sure failed, and he suffered loss for it. Now, if we go back to this first verse of the sixth chapter, we'll see that Paul is talking to folk here about repentance from dead works. You'll understand that Paul is talking to them not about salvation, but repentance. And you remember that John preached this to the people also. And what did he say? Bring forth the fruit that's worthy of repentance. He's talking about that which is the evidence of repentance. Repentance today does not mean the shedding of a few tears. It means turning right about face toward Jesus Christ, which means a change in your direction in your life, in your way of living. Now, many of these Jewish believers were returning to the temple sacrifice at that time. And the writer to the Hebrews was warning them of the danger of that. And before Christ came, every sacrifice was a picture of and pointed to his coming. But after Christ came and died on the cross, that which God commanded in the Old Testament now becomes sin. You see, those people were at a strategic point in time and history. They were at the time when a few days before they had come to the temple with a sacrifice because God commanded it, and now it's wrong for them to do that. Were you today to offer a bloody sacrifice, you would be sacrificing afresh the Lord Jesus Christ because you'd be saying that when he died 1,900 years ago, it was of no avail, and that you still need a sacrifice to take care of your sin. Therefore, you would not have faith in his atonement, in his death, in his redemption. Now, someone has said that today. We either crucify or crown the Lord Jesus by our lives. Today, we either exhibit a life of faith or a life by which we crucify him afresh especially 
today when we talk about getting back under the Mosaic system and we have to keep the law. It's a serious matter to go back on these things. Now let me look again at this word here. If they shall fall away. The word, as I indicated last time, happens to be a genitive absolute. Having fallen away. You can leave the F out. It's actually not in the text at all. And when someone says that this is the biggest F in the Bible, well, there's no F here. Having fallen away, or when they fall away. And if you want to use F, it makes, I think, better sense to use it, but not in the sense of condition, but argument, having fallen away. It'd be impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why? Well, we're talking about the fruit of salvation. And it's a serious thing to have accepted Christ and then to live in sin, then to nullify what you do by being a baby and never growing up and doing nothing in the world but working with wood, hand, stubble. Now, Paul put this same thing in a little different language in the Corinthians. He says, No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Your salvation is a foundation. You rest upon it. You can not only rest on it, you're going to build on it. Now, if any man build, Paul says, you can build with six different kinds of material, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. Now, what are you building with today? Are you building up a whole lot of wood, hay, and stubble? A lot of church work today is nothing in the world but wood, hay, and stubble. We are great on organization today and on committees and that sort of thing. But really, do our lives count for God today? Are there going to be people in heaven that will be able to point to you and say, because of your life or your testimony, you gave me the Word of God? And you remember he says, you should be teachers in the Word, and now you need somebody to teach you again. I rejoice today. And somebody said to me, how can you rejoice in that? They're taking your place. All these Bible classes that are springing up and they're using tapes in your material while they're going to saturate the world. Friends, I hope they do. Why? Because of the fact that is the purpose of all of this is to get out the Word of God today so that He can bless us, so we can grow up, so we can be a blessing to other people. And that is the thing that he's talking about here that is so essential. And there is a grave danger that we build in wood, hay, and stubble. And by the way, there is a difference between a straw stack and a diamond ring. You can lose a diamond ring in a straw stack because the ring is so small. And I'm afraid today that a great many folk trying to make an impression One pastor told me, said, I'm killing myself. I have to turn in a report this year bigger than last year. And we have to increase church membership and converts and giving and giving to missions. My friend, may I say to you, let's quit this building in wood, hay, and stubble. How many people were taught the word of God? How many people actually turned to Christ? How many people were really blessed? And that's the thing he's talking about here. He says, there is a danger that you're going to build with wood and stubble, and every man's work's going to be tested by fire. Now, what will fire do with wood and stubble? Poof, it's just going to go up in smoke. There'll be nothing left. And that's what he's going to talk about here. The fact that it'll be destroyed. That's what the Lord Jesus talked about in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. He says, I'm the vine. I'm the genuine vine. You are branches. Now, you're to do what? Bear fruit. You're to bear fruit. What kind of fruit? He says, I'd like a full crop of grapes. And he said again in a parable, he made it very clear that the seed falls on good ground. What's it to do? Bring forth 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. He'd like to get 100-fold. Now, he says, if there's a branch... It won't bear fruit. Why did he say, I'm going to take it away? I'm going to burn it. I'm going to remove it from the place of fruit bearing. And my friend, I think he's doing that today. 
Now, I look back here in Southern California over about 30 some odd years that I've been in this area. I came here in 1940. Well, I have watched a great many things happen. I have watched laymen. They were men who worked in wood, hay, and stubble. And then I've seen them work with gold. I know a layman that was so prominent when I came here, that man got involved in dishonest transactions. I wouldn't want to go into the presence of Christ as that man's going to have to go. I think that he's lost his testimony. And yet, a gifted man, and a man that you can't help but like, I even today consider him a friend. And then I know a minister. He was so attractive. In fact, he was a little too attractive. And he had an affair with another woman. It was not his wife. Finally divorced his wife. And he tried during all that time to keep on teaching, but it didn't amount to anything. He was just putting up a whole lot of straw, not even baling hay. He just making a big old haystack. And finally, the match was put to it, I guess, because he sure didn't leave anything down here. Oh, today, how careful we should be about our Christian lives. And we can't do this in and of ourselves. We need to recognize that He is divine. If we're to have any life, it must come from Him. And if there's any fruit, it must come from Him. It can only go through us because that's all a branch is. It's just sort of a connecting rod. That's all. It connects into the vine and it gets out yonder and bears some fruit, a few grapes out there. That's the thing that He's talking about here, friends. Now, let's look here again at what he's saying. If they shall fall away, having fallen away, having fallen down, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. The thing is, you can shed tears all you want to, but you've lost your testimony. That preacher came to me, talked to me. He said, I'm through. He's attempted to move to several sections up and down the coast in every place. He's had an affair with a woman. And what's happened? He's lost his testimony. He can't go anywhere today. May I say to you that he's talking about that here. It's impossible to renew them to repentance. I don't question his salvation. But I say this, a gifted individual, a man that can be mightily used to God, but not seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh They put him to an open shame. My friend, any time that you add any works to your salvation, any time that you are saying, I'm a born-again child of God, and then you live like the devil's son, then you're crucifying the Son of God because he came to give you a perfect redemption and to enable you by the indwelling Holy Spirit to be filled with the Spirit of God to live for him. Now, he goes on, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, that bringeth forth herbs meet for them for whom its dress receiveth blessing from God. These herbs bring forth a blessing to man. They are delicious to eat. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. Now, the word reject here is the same word Paul used. Paul says, I keep under my body that I might not be rejected or cast out, but that I might be disapproved. Paul says, when I come into his presence, I don't want to be disapproved. I don't want the Lord Jesus to say to me, you failed me. Your life should have been a testimony. It's not. And friends, you're going to hear it if you don't live for it. Now, somebody needs to say that. And I know that's not popular. It's lots popular today to have some comfort in music and read a lovely little poem and quote John 14 of the 23rd Psalm, and they're wonderful. Oh, my, how we need those. But my friend, you're going to stand before him someday, and you're before him today for that matter. Now he says you could be disapproved, and thank God Paul could say when he came to the end of his life, I finished my course. I have kept the faith. (laughs) I know there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Oh, to live for God today. But, beloved, 
Now this is the key. We are persuaded better things of you. Paul says, I'm persuaded that you today are going to live for God. And you're not going to be a babe in Christ, but you're going to grow up and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Now, work and love won't save you. But if you're saved, I tell you, this is what he rewards you for, which ye have showed toward his name and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Now, here's where good works come in. They certainly have an important part in a Christian's life but they have nothing to do with your salvation. Now he goes on. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now, how wonderful this is. Work and labor of love is not salvation. And we need the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, he's made a lot of promises to us if we're faithful to him. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. You know, when you take an oath, you take an oath on something that's greater than you are and nothing greater than God. So he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I'll bless thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thee. He promised Abraham that. But now God says, I'll take an oath. This is what I'm going to do. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. There's something here that I think is quite wonderful. He patiently endured. What? A new assurance came through trusting God, friend. You walk with God. You grow in grace and the knowledge of him and the knowledge of the word of God brings you to a place of assurance. And that assurance cannot be gainsaid. Now, verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Men take an oath on something greater than they are, and God did not swear by the sun, moon, or stars, but by himself, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So what are the two immutable things today? The death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and his ascension and intercession in heaven for you and me today. He mentioned four things in Romans 8. Now he divides them into two immutable things the death and resurrection of Christ. And now he's yonder, the living Christ at God's right hand, his ascension and intercession, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. Aaron was never a forerunner. But Jesus is. He's gone ahead. He's made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, he's going to talk about Melchizedek, and he sure hopes that you and I will not be babies, that we're going to be full-grown sons and hear him. We'll begin that next time. As Dr. McGee said, although good works have nothing to do with our salvation, they certainly do have a very important part in a believer's life. If you'd like a little more time to study and understand this important passage of Scripture, I'd like to remind you that you can go back and listen to this message or any of our messages, again, for free by visiting our website at ttb.org. Just click on the orange Listen button. And if you'd like to purchase Dr. McGee's entire five-year series on our Bible Bus flash drive, I encourage you to check it out in the Resources section of ttb.org, or you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE for some more details. Now, as we go, I'd like to remind you that December is Letter Month here at Through the Bible, and we really do want to hear from you. Your stories of how God is working in and through you are such an inspiration to all of us. So grab your tablet, your smartphone, or even that old pen and paper and take a few minutes to tell us your story. We love hearing about how our study of God's Word has blessed you or about what God is teaching you or maybe how the Holy Spirit is using God's Word to change your life. So write to us today 
Email us at BibleBus at ttb.org or send your letter to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And if you have any questions about this ministry or the Bible study resources we offer, including our terrific monthly newsletter that contains more great teaching from Dr. McGee and tips to help you apply what we are learning to your life, please call us at 1-800-652-4253 or visit ttb.org. Now tomorrow, our study of Hebrews continues as the Bible bus rolls along on its five-year journey through God's entire Word. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I look forward to hopping aboard with you tomorrow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.